Oki. 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 Oki and welcome. We acknowledge that we're gathered on the lands of the Blackfoot people of the Canadian Plains. We pay respect to the Blackfoot people's past, present, and future. We recognize the thousands of Indigenous peoples from many diverse nations call Lethbridge home, including members of the Blackfoot Confederacy, of the Six Gates of the Peak, Akana, Pekan, Siksika, and Skapi people, as well as other First Nations, Metis, and Inuit peoples. We respect Indigenous peoples' cultural heritage, beliefs, truth, and relationship to the land that stretches back in time. We will not blink at history. We will not blink at history. And we will learn from it. Oki is an invitation. A step forward. In Blackfoot, Oki means hello. Oki means hello. Hello. Oki. 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 And welcome to the lands of the Blackfoot people. Uh, I wanted to start off, uh, first off, before I begin, to, to clarify something. I attended last week's SACPA meeting with, with guest speakers, Dr. Mueller and Dr. Bellinger. Uh, I was interested to hear them speak, and particularly interested about Dr. Bellinger's uh, thoughts and ideas about homelessness. There's a comment on social media that I and one of my staff were, were laughing and smirking during the presentation. I can assure you that was not the case. There was a reference made to Councillor Dodik at the very moment he happened to appear outside one of the doors here at, uh, at SACPA, and he had just been away for three weeks, and he was there with his children, his grandchildren, and they were smudged up against the window, and uh, so we'd waved at them, and my apologies if that was taken, uh, a perceived way of, of laughing, is that was not the case. SACPA has hosted many diverse speakers and topics in a respectful manner, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. With that, I want to start off first of all with uh, our, our city council. So, oh, I hear I already went forward. Let's go back. There we are. All right, Knut. If I lay this step on here, that's not very good, right? We'll put it up here. So, um, in my many years on city council, we've never had a more cohesive team. Uh, we definitely differ on opinions and are passionate positions and can somewhat be heated in debate, and it happens quite often. But there's a mutual respect like nothing I've ever seen before. Uh, and, and you know, we, we talk about different personalities that are there, and especially we'll, we'll talk about the unique and diverse uh, backgrounds that similar to that of, of the community. So here I think today I'm joined by a few of them, and I think we've got uh, Councillor Schmidt-Rempel, and is that it? Councillor Schmidt-Rempel is here today. So thank you for being here today. So one of, the, one of the first things, uh, one of the slides is called community safety. It's something we hear about quite often. It's the number one issue that was actually identified in the last election, and again, throughout the IPSIS uh, community survey, is community safety. So uh, some of the reasons where we wanted more in increased police presence um, and replacing some of the lost resources that have happened over the years. Um, so we did do some of the requests from council. We asked to have an increased uh, sheriff uh, presence here in town, or sheriffs to be in town, as we'd seen that that was something that was, was addressed in Calgary and Edmonton as pro possibly a way to mitigate some of the concerns and the safety issues that some were feeling. So we did put that request forward. It did come back that it was, was, not, uh, was not approved. And I just want to read what was what was in that, that the letter that I'd received back uh, from Minister Ellis. Just one of the parts that is, you know, we, we didn't get the sheriffs, as, as he had mentioned here, that they're currently at capacity and not able to request further deployment of them at this time. However, in order to better understand the request should it arise again, they would be in com conversation with our uh, chief of police and we'll look at other ways to, to help those situations that are within our community. But one thing that was added to the end of the letter, which was, um, uh, was, was a great thing to, to be able to read, was that the ministry is, however, hiring additional safer community and networks and neighborhoods. So that's the scan units. And what the scan units do is, if there's different drug houses throughout the community, it's important that we have uh, a team that goes and addresses this, because these are the folks that are, are preying on those most vulnerable within our community. So I think it's really, really important important that, that we, we have these units in town. We do have SCAN 
not in town, but we bring them down uh, as needed. So if we find that there's a drug house that they needed to, to look into or, or to help uh, the community in this, the, with that safety response, they will travel from Calgary, Edmonton or other areas. That will be set up within our community. So that is, is extremely exciting in that the boots are right on the ground here. And to, first of all, get those that are, are preying on those most vulnerable within our community. So, so although I was not, uh, I guess, super pleased with the idea of, of the no sheriffs at this time, as they're not ad adequately trained for, for the work that needs to be done, I was really impressed and happy to see that the scan unit will be set up uh, within Lathbridge. Order. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about homelessness and begin by clearing, uh, defining the roles of the municipal and the provincial government in addressing the issues of homelessness. And we'll see up here, it uh, does a little bit of an explanation of, of where our quote unquote lane is. So we'll see the, the municipal government, the provincial government, and the different things that, that uh, both of them uh, are, are mandated to do. So the city began last year's remember some compassionate cleanups to somewhat control some of the health concerns that were within encampments of those that were, were homeless. Uh, entrenchment versus temporary, of course there's some, some, some concerns with that and some legal implications. So, and that could go everything from the criminal activity that does heighten once camps are entrenched. And we know that organized crime does, as I mentioned, similar to what the scan unit's job is to do, is they prey on those that uh, uh, are homeless and those that are, are, are most vulnerable within our community. And so it's important that, that we, we make sure that there's safety, not only for those that are, our neighbors are living close, but also those that are within the encampments. And as we noticed, there was uh, numerous stabbings, there was uh, sexual assaults and a shooting uh, in, in the tent area. So as these developments become entrenched, this is where the concern is. And so in saying that, we need to understand that we need a space, we need a place, space for these individuals to go. It's not fair to, to pull down and, and quote unquote evict uh, people from their from their their tents, but understand that that it's a it's a safety concern, and it's so much more complex. and I, And I'd really like to get into further details. But there's some of these uh, some of the issues that are are dealt with in these encampments are truly in camera or closed meeting uh, discussions. So, and to protect those that are within in these communities. And so, for example, if there's sexual assaults, we don't need to put that out there. We're protecting those individuals that are within the encampments. If there's uh, shootings that happen, there could be uh, investigation. So any of these things that happen are, are sometimes spoken within um, both the police and the commission and their in-camera discussions or within council if there's something that that we can do to, to help through these, these situations. So council is continually working on ways to better uh, uh, mitigate the, the issue that is there and to find solutions to help those that are homeless. So, and simply putting someone into a home is not the solution. You've all heard from Robin James that was here a few weeks back and, and I've had the opportunity of chairing that board from, for about six to seven years and still on the Leopard Housing Authority board and she does an amazing job. An amazing job in, in uh, helping those that are, are homeless or are needing, needing uh, uh, homes within the community. Now, we did, and I know, and I just want to give a quick example of something that has happened in the past. I was, I was approached by someone at a meeting and said, you know, we've got this person's homeless, they've been assaulted, is there anything that you can do? Well, that evening, thank goodness, we was, was able to touch base with, with Robin, and Robin actually came down to City Hall, and we put together a, a, a way to house this person temporarily until we could get something that was uh, more permanent. So we had her into a, a hotel, and after the hotel, we had a, a, a vacancy come available. Then we put her into, into a, uh, a home. Now, it lasted about, about three weeks. And the reason it lasted three weeks is it's, it's sometimes more simpler to house someone than to, to, to provide the support services that are needed to keep this person housed. So uh, it's, if it's the, the regular uh, mental health workers to go by, if it's, if it's them helping, um, we've got different, different workers within the community that, are, are, are help, that do help with things like setting up a budget 
you know, what can you do? What kind of friends can you have into to your home, etc. So there's there's so many things. And again, I'll use this word and I'll use it throughout this 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 lecture. Is it's very complex. And so this person was back on the street very very quickly after after being housed and working with that. This happens very regularly. We've seen six or seven just in the past two months. What we've done that. So understand the work is being done, and it's something that we need to be. Uh, aware of that organizations like Lethbridge Housing and others are doing a great job and are, are working to to help with these situations that we're facing throughout our community but it's very complex and in, in how how that is is dealt with and and as you can see up here many of the many of the responsibilities around addressing uh, homelessness and social issues are the direct mandate of other levels of government I hear it all the time well you're just shuffling it off to another level of government why don't you just do more well as we continue to do more, we have on one side people complaining about taxes and raises of taxes, and on this side we say we've got to do more. As we do more, does that mean the provincial government, not say they will, or the provincial or federal government says, well, if you're doing it, we don't have to support funding there. So all of a sudden now that falls on the taxpayers, and then that phone starts ringing. So it's a, it's a balancing act that needs to be looked at. Do we need to do this work? Absolutely, because these individuals are within our community, so it's important that we advocate on behalf of, of uh, the betterment of, of them. And, and it's important to understand as well that, you know, th everybody deserves a life of sobriety. Everybody deserves a home. Everybody deserves, in my opinion, uh, a work and to provide for a family. And if it's something that we can do, we're doing our best to, to make that happen by, again, working with other levels of government when it's not a mandate of, of the, the municipality. So say a little bit on this, about 2% of the funding to address social issues comes from City of Lethbridge taxation, 2%. So this could go two ways. We'll put a lot more in, or gosh, you're right. It's, it's mainly from another level of government that is their responsibility. So it's something to think about that 2% that is uh, deals with the social issues that comes from the C uh, City of Leopards taxation. However, as I mentioned, navigating the complaints, concerns, and challenges that these issues uh, present in the community remains the city's responsibility to shoulder. And of course, again, it's, we talk a little bit about downloading. We've heard it quite often of other levels of government downloading to to uh, taxpayers within a community. This is something that we've seen uh, all too often. Uh, so funding has been approved, however. Funding was approved by council at our April 18th meeting, and the details of that, and it's, and it's important, I'd encourage you to, to watch that meeting or, or be at that meeting if you can. The details will be announced at the May 16th council meeting, so directed administration to come back with some ways to, to uh, deal with some of these concerns that are are happening and will continue to happen within our community. Never forget, these. If, if we're talking about encampments and we're talking about tents and different, as some community members will say, less desirable areas, it's going to happen again. I don't want to tell you that it's not happening. It will happen. These people don't have a place to go. So it's important that we know what can we do to help them get to, to, uh, um, to, to become unhoused or become housed, I'm sorry, not become own house. Let's do, <laughs> we want them to be housed. <laughs> so supporting the vulnerable population. So Fresh Start, where I just had an opportunity being out here about uh, a little over a week ago, or I guess it was last week, time seems to fly, and uh, where Fresh Start it was added 50 additional treatment beds to, to Lethbridge. A total of 70 will be throughout Lethbridge and area with an additional 70 on the blood tribe here in uh, by next year. So they're going to start construction on that here shortly and will be additional beds. So be over 120 beds, uh, additional beds in, in the south for those that are struggling with, with addictions and uh, want to get to that life of sobriety and the life that everybody deserves. So we continue to strive to incorporate a holistic approach. So the entry points can't be the end points, of course. There must be more support to trans transition people through the complete rehabilitation. So we've heard quite often from this particular government is, is, is uh, talks about the ROCs, the recovery-oriented system of care. And it differs. There's, there's each government will come in with ways that they, they feel could help the community. And is one way right, one way wrong? It's a different uh, appro approach and a different opinion. So the establishment of these care campuses that, we've, uh, that we're looking at doing is again another huge step to, to move forward within our community. 
One of the things that was really exciting is, is uh, that was set up here last year was we created a board made up of invested local groups and uh, that included the AHS, the Blood Tribe Department of Health, City of Lethbridge, the, the provincial government, as well with a, with a focus on health. And so those meetings have, have uh, we've had a few meetings and we want to continue those meetings going forward on finding ways that we can work together on solutions. It's really simple and I was, I was just having a quick chat there with Violet earlier that it's, it's really easy to, to complain about a situation, but it's, it's much more difficult to say, what can I do to help? Be part of the solution, not part of the problems, I would say. So complaining is not going to fix the situation. Get together, let's work on, on common solutions. Everybody has ideas, and they're valid ideas and important ideas, and that we need to be able to look at all approaches and find ways that we can better help those that are struggling within our community. So as a, as a direct result of this uh, um, board, the Blood Tribe Department of Health became the new operator of the shelter, and that was effective in January 2023. Now, I, I want to make one thing very, very, it's a very important part that I wanted, wanted to mention is that they've taken over the shelter on January, January the 3rd. Understand that, again, complex word, it's a very complex thing to, to deal with the population they are. And so this organization has, did not get any information from the previous organization, did not get names, didn't get, they were there set up, away you go. It was a baptism by fire, literally. And the work that they have done has been second to none. We have seen uh, elders now in working with, with these uh, um, uh, displaced and homeless individuals that are at the shelter. And it's not, when I say elders, it's like, well, they're not all indigenous. No, they're not. But there's, it's, it's interesting to see all of those that actually have a respect for that culture and that way of healing. So it doesn't matter what you are, what's your race, what's your sex, your sexual background, anything, that doesn't matter because it's, it's a way that they've used that culture to be able to heal. And, and it doesn't mean, again, as I mentioned, that if, if you're Caucasian, you can't go to the shelter, you can't use a shelter, absolutely not. Indigenous and that culture has, has, has done uh, leaps and bounds on, on, on helping those that are struggling. As a matter of fact, the numbers that are coming out of there, and, and we'll get an update here um, next month, so in June, of how many have already been helped and are in, in recovery because of the work that's been done by, by those that are, are, are helping out at the shelter. So outreach work, outreach work et cetera, all of this work is being done by, the, by those that have uh, now taken over the shelter, which is, which is great to see. Physician recruitment, something of course we've all heard not far too much of because you can never hear too much about it. It's important that we make sure that we, we have those physicians that are within our community. So CBC Canada in February uh, this year estimates vary that there can be as many as 13,000 medical doctors in Canada who are not practicing because they've not completed a two year residency position and that is obviously a requirement for licensing. So. Federal issue again is uh, RBC Finance. The number of adults of Canada who do not have access to family doctor has risen to nearly 6 million from 4.6 million pre-pandemic. All right, so from 6 million to 4 point, from 4.6 up to 6. Situation is even more dire in rural communities. This is a real shocker. So rural communities, 8% of the doctors are serving 20 percent of the population. So if you think in the, within the city, there's an issue, and I'm not saying, you know, let's push it off everyone else. Everyone else has got it worse, and I, I'm not here to say that, but looking across uh, the country and even into some of our rural areas, those that do not have doctors, it's, it's, it's quite staggering, to be honest. So we do have 17 doctors. 17 doctors are not just said they're coming. 17 doctors are coming to Lethbridge. 16 are already here. I have 15, I updated it. We just had another one that is, is, has started. The, the names and the places of these doctors will be released shortly. They're just their last, they, they kind of get teamed up is my understanding. And again, I'm using some layman terms here with, it, with a doctor for their last part of their, of their study. And that is being completed uh, here in the next couple weeks. So they will be accepting and, and where the new doctors are, I will have something that comes out on that. But remember, this is, this is not a municipal uh, mandate, but guess who hears about when we don't have doctors? So it's important that we advocate on behalf of our community to the levels of government that do have responsibility with um, ensuring that we have doctors. 
so yeah, so the, of the 17, 16 are already here and, and will be, uh, some of them, seven of them are already taking clients and or, or uh, patients. And they can serve up to 2,000 patients. So some may be 1,300, some may be 1,500. So as you go through, if you, if you look, if you've got, uh, you know, these 1,700 doctors, we have 34, up to 34,000 additional people will have a doctor within Lethbridge. And that is not the pipe dream. This is happening. Those doctors have been hired. They are living currently in Lethbridge. So HS guidelines is, is, it's interesting to have a doctor, you don't actually have a physician until you've had your second visit. So if you went and visited a doctor over a concern that you've had, an ailment, you are not a patient of that doctor. You're still considered without a doctor until the second visit. I'm not sure why that is, but that's what I'm, I'm told. And so when you, if you're without a doctor, until you've seen a doctor two times, you are still considered without uh, having a doctor. Lethbridge has the highest increase per capita in Canada in the last year, but it's still not enough. I had the opportunity of being on a call with uh, uh, Prince Edward Island here last week with CBC, and they'd reached out and said, my goodness, we're comparing communities. He says, you're about just over 100,000, we're just under 100,000, and one of the only, one of four is what she had mentioned to me of, that has two post-secondary institutions in a community that size. And she says, I, what's happening here? We keep losing, losing, losing doctors. He says, and, and we've seen this story in the Globe and Mail that came out in Lethbridge and what you're doing. And of course, I was, I was on the call with the South Zone director and it's not us. It's, you know what, I'd love to take the credit as, as city council, it's not us. It's working together with those that uh, are, are within the government and, and AHS, not even within the government, within AHS, that are pushing for these doctors. And so Dr. Lowe is, is, has done an incredible work and I stay in touch with him on a regular basis just to get an update on what's happening with doctors in our community. And he has done a magnificent job, again, going back to these, uh, uh, doctors that have already been recruited. So we had the opportunity to talk with with uh, with someone out there with, from CBC, and and he says, "Well, what can we do?" And I says, "Well, I guess the best thing is to do is make sure that you stay in touch. You 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 tell those that are 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 working within this 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 crisis, I will call it, to touch base with their their local government, their provincial government. We did minimal. We put some dollars out for." for advertising uh, about coming to Lathbridge. But it mainly comes from word of mouth. Word of mouth, doctors that are here that have, have recruited. One I talked to has brought in 13 doctors. One specialist in town has brought in 13 doctors just by word of mouth. It's much easier than putting an adult to actually have that face-to-face -face conversation. It's brought that many doctors, which is, which is great to see. So we'll continue. Again, I'm not here to say the solution's all covered and we're, we're, we're fine with doctors. We need more. We can use 30, 40, whatever that number is, but we are doing better than most communities and it's something to be recognized. And I want to thank those that were involved from, from AHS and, and uh, the, the zone officer of the South here for all of his work with that. Now, one thing, a specific concern that has come up is uh, OBGYNs. We've heard that quite often. I, oh gosh, five minutes and I got seven slides. Okay. <laughs> I, I will speak this that um, that work is ongoing. We, I get updated on that on a regular basis. Again, not our mandate, but something I want to make sure that that, that those that are are um, that are, are pregnant and needing OBGYNs that they do have them. And we do have two that are I'm saying we HS two that are on mat leave and will be returning. And they're also looking at ways to to help with that. Oh, okay, let's just skip through here. Property taxes, downloading. I spoke a little bit about downloading. We hear some of the numbers with each one of your dollars, what amount goes to, to the different services. And so just quickly, um, we can see that up to 29% of our operating budget is to emergency services. But remember, we also collect the green acres and the school taxes. And that's, uh, uh, as you can see, there are about 24% that, that ends up leaving the city or, or is, is, is a provincial asset that we actually stand in. I won't say that it leaves the city because Green Acres builds uh, within our community, et cetera. So, but of your taxation, that is for Green Acres 24% and uh, school taxes. Third bridge, also a regular question. The last election, we had a non-binding vote on the third bridge. Results were in favor of pursuing. But one thing to remember, we need to do our research before. Too often it's, do you want a new bridge? Absolutely. Do you want to pay for it? Oh, no, I don't want to pay for it. 
So we need to provide all of the information so that everybody out in the community has an understanding what this is going to cost. What's, what's, what's it going to look like? What levels of government are going to kick in some, some funding or grant funding? So if residents had to, to cover the entire cost, which I would never, ever support, and I know Mayor Higgins wants a third bridge, absolutely want a third bridge. Do I want to pay for it? Absolutely not. We've advocated to other levels of government, and those conversations are ongoing. Up until just last week, received another letter that uh, I asked five, uh, I, council, had asked for $5 million to, to help with the planning. So we have a dollar amount. So now we can go out, what can we do? So that's, that's ongoing. Because I think most people probably want one if it was free. But it's, it's something that uh, we definitely have to look into other ways. Down to a couple minutes, say? Yep, three minutes. Another one, electoral changes. Same non-binding vote was had. Results slightly in favor. Once the conversation turned to cost of switching system, then the calls to oppose it went up. So we're exploring a hybrid model. And I want to talk about uh, Red Deer. Red Deer did this as well, but they were much better prepared, and I'll say this, than we were when this ballot went, or when this question went on the ballot. All the research was done before, and then it was put out, here's why we think we should not have, they were not in favor of award system. Instead, we put the ballot out, and then we decide to look at it after. Very backwards, so we've talked to consultants that have said, that was not the right way to do it. Similar to the bridge. You're not gonna say, hey, do you want a bridge? Absolutely, so that number's pretty high. But if we actually put it in there, it's gonna cost this, and it's gonna do this, and it's gonna do this that number may change. So it's important to do that research in advance. Curbside organics, green cards. I'm sure everybody has, has got them delivered to their, to their homes as of late. They'll be collected weekly from May to October. Understand May 16th, you've got these bins and we're loading them all up and, and that's great, but May 16th is the first pickup. So, and the Leopard's Loop app, which I'll talk a little bit, uh, I'm gonna skip to that very quickly, will, will come up. And with the Leopard's Loop app, that will give you um, a notification what bin is supposed to be out. I absolutely love this. And I guess I'm an app person, and if anybody else is, it comes the night before saying, get out your green bin, get out your blue bin, get out your black bin. This helps me a lot. Just a couple things going on in my mind on a regular basis, so I like to have that little, uh, uh, update on my phone, but also those those uh, calendar schedules will be out for for everyone to be able to to see when your uh, green bin will be picked up. Uh, if you're already using a backyard compost, feel free to continue using it. Of course, we do have the little bins that come along with it, but that's if you're using it on your garden, absolutely continue with that, and that's that's fine. Some of the things I wanted to touch base on that was, was interesting, and, and I had to actually confirm this because I, I didn't realize it was actually included. So meat, fish, bones, dairy products, cooking grease. I had no idea, cooking grease. But I guess with that going down uh, the drain that some people might put on toilet or, or sink, you can see what happens when you, when you add uh, cool water or anything to, to grease solidifies, and that's an issue for, for our pipes and our, our infrastructure for sure. So the collection trucks from your home and delivers the organics processing facility at the Waste Recycling Center. From there, it's made into compost to be used in community gardens, par parks, projects, and actually sold for uh, agricultural uses. And I'm almost there. One minute, is that what you're saying? The one minute up? Okay, let's scoot down here too. Okay, uh, 311 in Lethbridge Loop. 311 has been great, and I did have a bunch of stats here, but I won't, I won't maybe bore you with them, but there's some pretty exciting how many calls have come in over the year. But it's a one-stop shop for concerns and inquiries that, uh, um, that come in from the community. Understand, we're not as council saying, we're gonna step away from this and just deal with 311. Calls, if they come to council, we will get on to 311 and make that same request. And over 80, sorry, 90% of the calls are answered within 30 seconds. The calls are answered, you may not get the response that you want, but the calls are answered that time and then that conversation starts. So 311 has been an incredible asset to our community. And also it does update you on a regular basis of when your garbage to be picked up. And the very last thing, and I'll take 30 seconds, oh, 30 seconds in this one if I could. It's about our, our new website, because it's reduced from 2,200 pages to 300. Going through and navigating our old website was just an absolute nightmare. I would go on Google before I'd go on the website to search it. So this is great. You should be six clicks or more to be able to get an answer. It's under three now. Clean new design. It's, it's uh, uh, much simpler, icon-based, and much easier to navigate. So with that, 
thank you very much for, for hearing me out here today and, and again for the opportunity to attend uh, SACPA. Thank you, Violet. Now, uh, we're, it's time for questions. We ask that those waiting to ask please line up against this wall. Please state your name and your question briefly. We don't want any long statements or preludes or stories, please. And above all, please be respectful and polite. If you prefer to write your question, only those that are legibly written and signed will be asked by the moderator. That's me, so you can hand it to me if you like. And so we'll go with the first question. Okay. Hello, I'm Roberta Stevens, and uh, I want to thank the mayor for your update, particularly on the social issues, which is what I'm interested in. So that was that was really helpful. And I wanted to ask you about a report I read in the Lethbridge Herald, uh, April 21st, the CS CSD report. And the Herald did cover this. It's a report that went to council. And there were pretty uh, shocking uh, statistics in there. Um, Lethbridge having one of the highest child poverty rates in Canada. The average income in Lethbridge is below the provincial average. And then all the accompanying social issues that go along with those facts. And um, I just wanted to know what council, I, I know this report has gone to council, what is council's uh, view of this report and what would be the council's priorities in addressing some of these social issues that are facing Lethbridge? Great. Th thank you very much for that question. As I mentioned earlier and, and uh, on May, May 16th, Thank you. Being alert, thank you. May 16th is coming back to council. So some of these concerns we have also addressed within in-camera discussions, but it's important that that information is passed on to the public. A lot of these questions that you have will be addressed on May 16th, which is, is uh, I welcome you to be at that council meeting. What do we need to continue to do is, uh, again, we need to continue our advocacy efforts with those that are responsible for so many of, of the things that you had mentioned. Um, uh, homelessness, if it's child poverty. Yes, as a community, they, they live within our community, but this is something where the funding comes from other levels of government, so it's our responsibility to make sure that we advocate on behalf of the community for this level of funding, and if we don't get it, some of the things that we've done is we've addressed them locally and have, have supported with, with additional funding locally. So it's, I'd welcome you to come forward to, to that council meeting and hear more of what uh, that result's going to be because we've had a lot of conversations on that. So thank you very much for the question. My name is Knut Peterson. <coughs> and thanks very much, Blaine, for making sure that uh, the air conditioner got turned on here. <laughs> uh, my question relates to the third bridge. I've always wondered why <clears throat> most of the shopping in Lethbridge is concentrated in the very south end of town. Uh, why has there not been, or is there plans to, to uh, entice uh, stores to come to the west side and build the stores there because that would eliminate a lot of traffic uh, and maybe some light industrial area in, on the west side could could help to stem the tide from that heavy traffic every morning and afternoon uh, do you have any thoughts on that Thank you, Knud. And yes, that's something that I hear quite often. Why don't you have, for example, why don't you put a Walmart on the west side? Not to that, that point, but what can we do to entice? And that's exactly it. We could all put many different things together to, to, to help uh, create a package for those that are looking for areas to expand. If it's, if it's uh, um, and I'm not saying big box stores, any, any type of business to, 
but I hear that quite often. Why isn't there a Costco? Why isn't there a Walmart? Why isn't there a Canadian Tire? Why isn't there a lumber yard on, on the west side? We can provide the space and we can provide the land or developers can provide the land, but we can't ever direct different businesses to actually build there. So just yesterday I had a, had a call says, my goodness, he says, it's so busy. There's over 40,000 people on the west side and I, there's not a Walmart over there. And I know again, I, I, it's not considered the most local uh, uh, business, but let's face it, there's, it's a very biz, busy uh, uh, business. And again, that same question comes out is we can't tell them where to have them. They do all of their work in the background and then they come to the city, what do you have available in this area? We've got expansion in this area, we've got expansion in that area, what can you do? But to your point, Knut, is, is the more that, that people will build and construct on the west side, it's, it's less taxing, say, on the roadways or another bridge. So is that something that can keep um, um, folks in it within an area to be able to, to shop, work, play, um, their children go to school? So yeah, that's almost like I'm talking 15 minute cities or something, but I'm truly not. <laughs> anywhere within Lethbridge we can get. But you see that in Calgary, a lot of places, it's, it's your, your community is your community and it's easy to get around. So that's what I can offer. We can't, there could be maybe tax incentives, which again, what happens on the other side? Well, I've got a business here and you didn't give me a tax incentive. So it's, it's a, a, a tri <laughs> trialing thing for sure, but we will just offer the opportunity and the land and ha put it available for those that do want it. But we have to make it available for sure. Uh, Mr. Higgin, my name is Graham Greenlee. I was wondering uh, when the city is going to allow uh, animal control officers to patrol the, um, the Six Mile Cooley area. A lot of people treat that as an off-leash dog area, and it's not supposed to be. Uh, off-leash dogs are a very negative impact on ground dwelling and ground nesting birds. Yep. Great question, and you know what? I, I wish I had the answer for that, but uh, it is something that I will definitely know. The staff here that are here will will jot that down. Is it's it's administration? Some will ask of administration, and I wish I had a direct answer. If you wouldn't mind leaving an email, or or if we can send that through to SACPAW, if uh, reply to some of these questions, I'd be more than happy to do that. But I unfortunately don't have a timeline for that, nor do I know if it's something that's being looked into, but I'll definitely uh, make sure that we do look into it. And, and you're right, it's, you, you see a lot of things, and if I run the coolies, you're, you slip on a few different things that are down that area, and I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. But thank you for the question, we will get back to you on that. Thank you. My name is Ed Adenovu. Thank you for covering the uh, homeless issue in the city. Um, about three years ago, um, Christian organization Master C had a proposal to change one of the older buildings in the downtown for uh, homeless housing. And the, I believe the entire current city council rejected the proposal. Um, and now we are talking about provincial government throwing some money as electricity coming up and so forth. You know, now this is a big issue and so forth. What happened three years ago when the whole council rejected that? I think it's not, it's not a rejection of the organization. The organization does incredible work. Understand that. It's not a rejection of the organization. We had community input, so we had businesses in the area, community input, which is the engagement is a, an important part to, to make in any decision. And so when uh, Mustard Seed came down, they're, and they're still looking at other, other locations, but that particular location just did not work within local businesses that have just come through a, uh, a pandemic or were on their way through uh, a pandemic and had issues previously that they had within that area. So there was a concern of that location. Again, it's a NIMBY thing. We hear that all too often. And I'd be one of the first to, to, to say that that's, that's what we hear most. I don't want it in my backyard. They'll continue to look at solutions. So something we brought up at council here just, just a, a couple weeks back is, what can we do to, to, when we're developing land, to put some of these in in advance? This is what's going to be in, in within this uh, uh, development. If it's dog parks to maybe help with some of this, if it's uh, uh, social housing, if any of these type of things that, uh, through the planning stages, will make it easier so that when you're 
when you're building out, community realize that that's going to be something that's going to be going to take place uh, within that community. So finding the area is extremely difficult, and it's engaging within within the local businesses, and it just didn't fit as, as you'd recognize that a majority, I think it was unanimous, did not support that particular area, not the organization, but the area and the, and the engagement that needed to happen. So my apologies if that didn't answer with the way that you wanted, but, but that's uh, how it was. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you, Mayor Higgin, and I'm glad you're at SACPA, and I hope there's more visits. Anyway, Barb Phillips, I'm just pulling six words out of your speech, and they're all C words. I caught that. I'm not really into alliteration, but here we go. Complex, compassionate, caring, community, and cost. Those all came up. Uh, first of all, going to compassionate, I think it's a bit of an oxymoron if you say that taking down the encampment was a compassionate cleanup. Uh, just from boots on the ground last summer, it wasn't very compassionate when I fear that maybe a lady's mother's urn disappeared into those bins. So just saying that. I have been boots on the ground, so I kind of know from whence I'm coming. Uh, I, a very good friend of mine fell out of a porta potty, overdosed. Uh, the good part of it was that her organs were able to be taken and she uh, saved six lives because of that. But getting to the point of encampments again, because as sure as we get heat in Lethbridge and we get dandelions and other things, the encampments will be back. So does that end then? Uh, I was a little bit complaining last year because of the need for potable water for people to drink when it's plus 30 and also for bathroom facilities. So I'd ask that you maybe uh, comment on those two issues and I think you solved the other issue with what you were paying the clean sweep people I believe but you can comment on that too thank you thank you very much Ms. Phillips appreciate those questions again I'm not going to put it off to the May 16th but many of these things that you've discussed and, and the questions you had have been looked into and will be part of of answers at that meeting but I can say this that we, when, it, when it comes to the, the porta potties and, and that work, administration will bring recommendations forward. We can give direction um, to administration to look into, and this is some, some of the things that we've done. Now, porta potties is not part of it. The potable water was, as last year, Councillor Palladino brought a resolution forward, and we're, we're looking at that so that the, the different fire hydrants could have water fill stations on them. So, regarding any of the other uh, uh, comments of of uh, porta potties, etc. That is something that has not been brought up at, at council, but it's one that I will actually take and make sure that we do ask that question and get an answer for you. Thank you. Hi, Blaine. <laughs> nice to see you. One of your, uh, your predecessors. Your name. Your name. Uh, Trevor Page. One of your predecessors recently surprised SAGPA by saying that in his term of office he could never find out how many employees the city had. Now, I wonder if that issue has been uh, resolved now and whether you could tell us how many employees you have uh, in the city. Thank you. Like my predecessor, I wish I had the exact number for you. And I, I, I'm sorry, I don't have that exact number. As it fluctuates as well for summer staff, et cetera, but we've always noticed 1,300 to 1,600. Now that's part-time, it's full-time equivalents, all of them put together. So that number is uh, 13 to 1,600 is what, what we have been told. So gosh, I, I wish, I'm sorry, Trevor, I, I wish I had a better answer than my predecessor, but that's, uh, and it varies, it varies over time as well. I do, I will make a comment on this though, as, as we went through the KPMG um, uh, studies, there was, they found in some of the comments that um, uh, we were possibly overstaffed in certain areas, and that was addressed, there was up to 100 positions that were either through attrition or or um, uh, layoffs that did happen through that report. So there's, Positions, it's a really difficult thing because we did drop some when it came to some of the parks and then, then we saw the community 
at, at outrage that you know the grass wasn't being cut enough and so then we put dollars in after we gave that direction to to help support the parks and so it's it's a, it's a cyclical thing that we're that we're in and it's and it's uh, it's it's tough to give you the exact answer but I'm saying between 12 and 14 up to 1600 of, of between part-time and full-time staff Mayor Higgin, I have a question that's been sent to me by Laurie Schultz, our chairperson, who is unfortunately unable to be here. Actually, I think it's a three-part question. Mayor Higgin, SACPA is honored to have you speak today. Thank you for your presentation. Of the stakeholders involved in the issue of people who are houseless, as well as those individuals experiencing addictions, I have three questions. First, what face-to-face -face conversations have you yourself had with those individuals, i.e. stakeholders, who are houseless and those experiencing addictions? Two, have, how have these conversations informed and shaped your understanding of day-to-day -day living experiences and challenges for those stakeholders? And how have these conversations informed and shaped the actions required to be taken by the city to make real on the ground change for the lives of these individuals specifically. That's a lot. No, I don't have a photographic memory, so we're, okay. I'll, I'll address the okay. first one here. How often? I'm not going to be one that says, you know, I, I want to tout through social media that I've traveled and went through all these different encampments. At least every second day, I went to every encampment that was of any size within our community, walked through them. I've also taken on one occasion, probably uh, there was four, four different groups that wanted to be away from the encampments but needed a ride to, to their home and traveled out on four different occasions for that. I'm not going to go on social media and public, look at what I did. I went through and I see the struggles that they have. This is what brought forward a lot of the, the questions that I brought to the intergovernmental uh, round table with the Blood Tribe Department of Health and others is by getting in there and walking through and seeing it. Evenings, going to the different areas, walking the different streets, I've, I've done that. And if I haven't been with a particular group, I've done it myself. I've went out there. Again, I'm not going to, to say that I've went out every single day, but if it wasn't every second day, it was darn close to every second day I would go through these encampments, as well as I've spent a lot of time over at the, the shelter and uh, um, in just finding out exactly what some of their challenges are so and there's a lot of challenges and and it breaks my heart I've had family members that have passed from from uh, overdose it's I don't tell that out there as well but it does hit home because I know personally many and I'm sure as many of us do that have, have had to, to live with that and so it's something that um, the hard-nosed approach or the compassionate approach and we've heard with the C's here it's, it is a compassionate approach. We do need to, to, to realize that these folks are homeless. They do need a place to go. They do need the services uh, to get back into a life of sobriety. And you know what? Some will say, well, maybe they don't want that life. We need to make sure that we're, we're compassionate in, in, in all levels. But yes, I have been numerous times to, well, quite a few times, more than numerous, uh, throughout the different encampments, and, and I have seen what takes place within them. And what's, do you have more to carry on? Does that, because I know you had a few other things. Uh, well, she had also asked if, uh, how the conversations might have shaped understanding. Oh, how the understanding. Oh, or no, wait, uh, shaped the actions required to be taken by the city. Okay, and, and again, these, these comments I've shared quite often with our city manager and, and the staff, different things that I've seen, and I've been told this is, why are you doing that? Why are you, like, sometimes it's, it's a concern for, for safety, but it's important. If, if, if I don't know what's going on, I, I need to see it by, by walking those streets, and so I've been out there. Thank you. <coughs> Hello, Mayor Higgins, Ken Sears. Um, right at the beginning of your talk to say this afternoon, you start you talked about asking the province to send or to second sheriffs into the city and that was turned down and then you talked about the um the scan teams now and that again from what you tell us you requested them and it was turned down and you were told that if it was needed they would send a team from calgary or edmonton how does that change how has that changed or different from what's going on now 
And how was that answer as you report, you seem to be at least optimistic about that answer, so I'd like you to sort of explain that. And a second unrelated question, but it's something I think you probably should have been expecting, potholes. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. Well, and that's a great point. If, if we do need to scan units, the calls are made in. These units come down sometimes once a month. We have over, over 250 last time identified drug homes within our community. Over 250. Having someone here on a regular basis, not once a month, they used to come down once a month, or they'd get a bunch of information together, they would come down. That's tough to really get the boots on the ground to, to, to deal with some of these uh, concerns that we have. So at over 250, and again, an anecdotal number, and it's, it's something that I've heard, so I, I would uh, definitely recommend everybody look into that, but it's the last that we've seen is over 250 homes that are, are within our community that need to be looked into. And so having a local scan unit will definitely, definitely help that on a daily basis, not on a monthly basis. Oh, and the potholes. Yes, you're right. Coming out of my house, I think I need a wheel alignment myself. I want to touch base a little bit on potholes because as, as temperature changes, it's, it's, it's a time when, when the frost is coming out of the ground and, and I've got this explanation, so I'm, I, I just asked our city admin to, to give me a layman's uh, explanation on this because I don't want to know how many pounds per square surface of gravel goes in these. Why do we have potholes? Why do they exist? Why aren't we packing them? Temperatures make a big difference. So for example, you can't, you can't fill a pothole when the frost is coming out. Your, your job will be gone within a day. The next morning when that frost is out, it pops it out. Temperatures have to be between a set amount, and I wish I could tell you what those temperatures were. I was told that between a certain uh, 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 level, and that will keep that uh, from them having to go back and refill it again, and hiring more, more staff to do said thing. So it's... it's uh, <laughs> complex but it, it is it's something we're definitely we need to there's potholes all over but it's the time that you need to do them and this one is ex especially rough this year because of the different temperatures of freezing and cooling that we had so bear with us they're doing an amazing job our our, our staff are out uh, day and night uh, working on potholes and so um, with patience I'm sure we'll get there Thanks, Mayor. Uh, my name is Ian Hurdle. Uh, I just came back from the States, and maybe we should feel well because my sister's municipal area there has four bins of the big place, so where the heck would you put them? Anyway, my son lives in an older neighborhood, and on both sides of him there are elderly people, and it's ground level in the alley to get their bins out they could not bring them through their fences or get them down the front steps, even if they tried. So they would have to take them all the way around the block. Uh, I know you're trying to protect your alleys, but there was a suggestion for Saskatoon, and what they do is they make one pass through the alley, and they only do one side of the alley. Hmm. Well, all right, well that's, that is interesting. I, I, I'll address a little bit here about if there's a concern of an elder cannot get out a, a one of their one of their bins, please call through one. We do have staff that will help with that, and and there's just they'll get their numbers in because it's important. And and I, I couldn't agree more. Is we want to make sure that we protect those that are are struggle to get um, you know these bins. Sometimes they'll come through a fence and downstairs, which is difficult. So. 311, I would say, please address 311. They do have folks in our team that will help uh, um, with that, and so and find a way to, to 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 help them get those those bins where they need to be to be picked up. And driving down the one side, I'd like to hear more about that because, and we'll touch base after. Thank you. Bev, <coughs> Bev Mundell Atherstone. Thank you so much, Mayor Higgin, for being here. See, it's not so scary. <laughs> We're not gonna bite you. This is just a public affairs forum. We want everyone to know what the city is doing. Um, I'm very happy to hear that you have a passion and a concern and a heart for the homeless. That's terrific to know. Okay, I have two suggestions and two tiny questions. Okay, my suggestions are in regard to the third bridge. If you notice, if you're, if you're on Hoopa during the main um, uh, traffic times, those are only two times during the day, around 8 and 9 in the morning and around 
four to five at night. So my two suggestions are, one is to have more staggered time, uh, times of beginning work downtown and staggered times of school starting so that people are taking the kids and going to their, their jobs at different times so we don't have that main thing. But the other suggestion I have is looking forward to the future. And that is to look at a monorail that goes around Lethbridge the downtown, then it goes to the college and to the south side where the, where the big box stores, where there's a drop off point, and then comes across to the west side, stops up at the west side, stops up at the university, and then comes back around. It could be electric, it could be future thinking, and it would alleviate a lot of that, and a lot of our students would be able to have um, cheaper rides and faster rides. Okay. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much for uh, Barb Phillips' question about the porta potties for the homeless. Uh, that was a real lack. If any of you know, what the city provided was bags for people to poop and pee in in their tents. Um, and that was not a, a good solution uh, because people ended up um, pooping and peeing in other places. So, porta potties would, is a great suggestion, and please bring that back. What I would like to know, here's my big question, why can't we use some of those empty big box stores like the Save On Foods on the north side during the winter as a place for people who are unhoused to sleep and have uh, food and have uh, a place to shower and go to the bathroom and so on. I've mentioned this to various members of city council and I've been blown off. You know, the saying, oh, the, it's, it, we'd have to change the bylaw, and oh, it would cost too much. Well, Save On Foods, that, that shop <clears throat> apparently has a, a roofing problem. Uh, there are a lot of roofers in Lethbridge. I'm sure if, we, if the city put out a question, please, roofers, can you come and help us fix the Save On Foods so that we can find a shelter for people in the winter? Yes, I see you by that. Um, so, can you tell me, is, are there any plans to use some of these empty places, either in the winter when it's cold or in the summer when it's too hot? Thank you so much. All right, I'm going to take the monorail back to my office. No, thank you very much. It's a uh, great question, but forward thinking for sure, right? That's a monorail, gosh, I, I never thought about that one. But if you have a way that we can get that for no cost, I, I want to <laughs> be part of that. Um, talk about some of the, and I want to hop right to your, your question. I was just jotting down as you're going here, if I could. If I could. Um, uh, the the porta potties, and I'm going to look into that. I had absolutely no idea if that was was confirmed that bags were being passed out to to do your one and two in. I had no idea. I don't. I will. I will look into that. Sorry, I don't have an answer for that. The next one, Save On Foods North. I've heard that all too regular there. Safeways, any of these open big buildings, these are not buildings of the city of Lethbridge. These are private, privately owned. They would have to be approached if that is is to be to to be a solution. But it's not for us zoning. We could we could look at the zoning, but the actual uh, building is. Uh, and I know what that particular one that won't happen. There's a safety concern with the, with the roof. I remember, I'm gonna date myself, but I helped construct that, that, that building when it was first built. And there is, there is an issue with, uh, with safety in there. But it comes down to this. This is not, that's not one of our facilities. So we do need to look at what we do own or what we have the ability to, to, to help support those in, those in need. But yeah, it would be great to, to have that building. And, but I know that that's, is not something that, that the current owner would, would do as the pushback from his other tenants that are within the community. And I know we're saying it could be great, we can do things to make us better. The tenants, you've got 50, 60, 70 tenants there and I'm sure that the landlord looks to that. So it would be his decision still though, if, if they were to do that. But thanks for the question and the monorail, I don't want to talk about that too. Thanks. Are you okay with one more question? Sure. <clears throat> name is Doug Neal. Uh, somebody brought up the subject of bins, so I won't ask when we're going to get our yellow bin. Um, <clears throat> I don't like your green bin. Um, 
you say we shouldn't complain unless we have a solution. Well, my solution is take my grass cuttings, put it in a bag, and take it to recycling. And it doesn't stink when you leave it in the, around the house. The other solution would be to <coughs> take, use one bin and have it all go into a place where it produces, the garbage produces electricity. I've said it before, and it ha they do it in Europe. The emissions are not that strict. So why not take the garbage, use one bin, have people pick out the recyclables, shove it into a, one of these machines that turn the, the garbage into electricity. Then you don't need all the bins. One bin will do. One bin will do you. <laughs> Thanks so much for that question, and you know what, you're, you're along my, my uh, train of thought because it's something I've always thought about and, and going to what they do in Europe in many areas are these micro incinerators, which produce energy. So I mean, anything can go into these bins, but you know what, this is a process that was uh, decided on council, whether it's unanimous, not unanimous, it's a, a decision that was made at council to move forward. Going back is, is uh, we need to look at what we've, uh, with these green bins, see what they do over, over the next how many years. And regarding the smell, um, if they're, I'm hoping your clippings within two weeks from the time that it's picked up isn't rotting and smelling too much, but I understand what you mean. A lot of people will use them on their gardens as well. And, uh, but incinerators, I absolutely love what you're talking because I, I think incinerators are, are incredible. We don't need to have land, landfill space and anything can go in there and it's not waste because you're actually creating energy from that. So great question. Unfortunately or fortunately, depends on the way you look at it, the green bins are here and I've, I am hoping that we, we use them and, and uh, for what they're, we've, we've said that they're supposed to be used for and, and we can move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Higgin, very much. Thank you all for your questions. Um, I hope we can make this an annual and that you can come back and see us again next year. Is there any take home message you'd like to leave with us? I've seen this, so it's a kind of a trick question, but I think uh, pretty simple for, for, for me and it's a comment that I usually leave with my monthly Herald article is be respectful and kind to one another. And that's what I think we can all, and, and a comment came up and I know at the last meeting, I thank Ms. Phils for that. It says if we can just be happier and, and more respectful of one another, I think we'll get a lot further in life. And so let's work together as a, as a community and together we're definitely stronger and we're better. So thank you so much for your time today, I appreciate it. <laughs>